a provincial government corporation working for the people of British Columbia. Last Wednesday, when we talked, Mrs. Jensen, you made a promise. Watch. Oh, you take liquor. All right, next headache, I'll try anise, and maybe it'll change my mind. Maybe it won't. So, what's the verdict? Oh, Anison changed my mind, all right. Did it ever. I took just two tablets over 900 milligrams, right? Right. And my headache just took off, no problem. What do you, t what do you say, uh, Anison adult strength? That's right. Anison has adult strength. BCTV! Good morning. Whether you like it or whether you don't, you as a Canadian taxpayer are now a shareholder in the near bankrupt exploration company called Dome. Oh, these liberals, there's no end to their gall. But an explanation about what they're really doing with Dome to revive the economy of this country is going to come from the charming, inimitable Jean Chrétien who just taken off one hat in the cabinet and put on another hat and now becomes the instant expert on our apparently disastrous national energy policy, Jean Chrétien. And on the happy side of the news this morning, I've got Tex Enemark, president of the BC Mining Association, and Charles Bourne, who's the CEO of Plaza Developments, to tell us that, thank God, there are still 17,000 miners at work in British Columbia. The other side of the coin you'll get later. But first, Jean Chrétien, after the break. There's not much doubt about it that Dome was on the verge of total bankruptcy, owed 1.3 billion in payments last Friday. And after a fair amount of dilly-dallying, the Liberal government has charged to the rescue with our money. Mr. Chrétien, is what you've really done just bail out the banks to prevent the total financial system of the country reeling under the shock of eight billion in loans to Dome? I, I think that the problem was very complex, and uh, you know, one of the problems with Dome was that uh, they are involved in almost any oil and gas play in the country. And because they were in a terrible financial shape, they were freezing every, you know, activities in a lot of areas because in the oil and gas play, there is always four or five partners, and if one cannot go, nothing goes. And there was the uh, problem, too, of uh, the, uh, the banks who were really involved in that. And How the, badly involved? Quite a lot. If you had not come to the rescue, would it have shaken international confidence and damaged our economy even more than it presently is slumping? I think that it was important because of the magnitude of the problem to step in. But rather than to do the, what you call the traditional bailout, uh, we have decided this time that uh, we were to bargain a position into the company. And it's exactly what, what we've done. We have a uh, debenture that we can convert in shares. You know, I can convert the shares at 250 and the market was 325 on Friday. So coming into the rescue, I managed to have a good deal for the taxpayers. If the oil and gas industry turn around, I am quite sure that it will have been a, a very good investment, but I did not do that for that. I, there was the other circumstances that uh, forced us in. Mr. Chrétien, I shall be accused of being far too nice Nelly. You know that liberals are not liked in this part of the world at this particular moment, correct? You know that the, I think the Liberal that Party under Pierre Trudeau couldn't be elected dog catcher in British Columbia. Oh, we're having these problems at times, and we managed to come back. I, I, I would admit that we're having problems now, yes. Now, you've inherited all this problem, but would you concede to me that the basic problem with the economy of this country today was your loaded energy policy? Petrocan, Petrofina, all this money poured into expensive, risky developments such as the Beaufort Sea. 
No, I think that uh, this uh, Beaufort Seed uh, play is going on since years. When I was Minister of Northern Affairs in th from 68 to 74, you know, it was at the time that we started to explore the Beaufort Sea. And let me tell you that uh, if you don't explore the potential of areas like that, you don't know exactly what you've got. And from your native Scotland, if nobody had gone in the North Sea, you know, the situation will be uh, worse there than it is today. Oh, the Nazis are a playpen compared to... They tell me it'll cost $80 a barrel to bring oil out of the Beaufort Sea. And it's still only $3 a barrel to bring it out of the ground you know, in the, Saudi Arabia. There is two problems. There is a problem we have to find out if we've got some oil or gas up there. And there is a problem of taking it out. Suppose that it's too expensive to take it out in the early period. You know, perhaps we'll leave it there. But I, I'm, I'm sure that there will be some day where we will have to take it out and we'll pay the price for it. And of course, at this time, if you're telling me that it's $80 a barrel, you know, there will be no market for that. Well, that's what it is, I believe. Yeah, but you know, Even the problem is to have a, a rational industrial policy in Canada, you have to know what you've got in terms of energy. But Otherwise, you cannot make long-term planning. Well, it was quite obvious that Smiling Jack, Gallagher and Richards spent far too much money exploring far too expensively for a non-productive product at the moment. I think that uh, while some will disagree with you, they will not say that what caused the problem, it was the Beaufort Sea exploration. A lot of people will talk about some of the acquisition they made Hudson's at the worst Bay. time in the market. The $4 billion to take over Hudson Bay just when the market was going over yeah, the cliff. Yeah, but you know, that is not the Beaufort Sea. So you were talking about the Beaufort Sea, now you're talking about the other part of the problem. Two bad pieces of management you know, under the old dome. I, there is, uh, there is, you know, I don't agree with you when you say that investing in the north with the incentive they had uh, were a bad investment. The question of moving into the Hudson Bay at that time, you know, with the, uh, you know, the, the debt load they had to take for that. That was bad. You know, they created a hell of a problem for their and cash you, flow. You, you've rescued the company and you've rescued the banks. And we've made a good investment. You know, rather than give a loan guarantee as it was in so many cases elsewhere, we decided that this time that we'll take a different road and we work our position into the company with a, a debenture that is a debenture today, but in the next... Uh, 18 months, I can convert that debenture in shares at 250. Oh, Dome is really now a crown corporation. No, 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 no. Part no. of Petrocan, almost. No, 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 no. What is it then? No, because we you don't. You said I can. The government has taken over Dome, hold its bolus. No, no. If you want to buy my position in, in Dome, I will sell it to you, Jack. Apparently, you're making quite a lot of money. It's only $500 million. And That's partly my money, too. <laughs> yes, but, you know, just to show that we're not taken over Dome. We came to solve the problem. And I said that last week, if somebody wants to take the federal position into that play, we're willing to do that. Well, I have an option at 250. The market was 325 on Friday. If and it's want. down 15 cents today. It might be, you know. It might go down to a buck and a quarter. Yes, but if Dome had gone belly up, the shareholder would have had nothing. And where would the banks have been? Would have been in some trouble, too. Serious trouble. Serious. The problem is the bank would have survived that, but the, it would have put a hell of a squeeze on the money market in Canada. And, and many other businesses would have suffered. And it might be that there would have been a lot of hesitation in the future by the financial institution to invest in oil and gas. And if the financial institution don't invest in oil and gas, who is suffering most? Is the West. How many because there is no oil and gas in Ontario and Quebec. How many people's jobs were saved by your action? Oh, I don't put the emphasis on that, but something like 9,000 jobs uh, in all the complex of, uh, of Dome and plus the other companies. But we went into that because of, uh, you know, the problem there was in the oil and gas field, the problem, the stress that that was putting on the banking system and so on. And rather than just give a loan and take the risk and not take the eventual profit, we decided to get it into a form of equity. As a matter of fact, as part of your continued policy of Canadianization of yes. all our resources. Yes, and in that, we will rem the government will remain in a minority position because there is the shareholders, there is the banks, and there is the, uh, the federal government. So we are in a minority position. We're not controlling it. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, we're taking Dome at 35% Canadian-owned, and it will be well above 50 do you so think, it will have become a Canadian company. Do you think that Morris Strong will be a better manager than Smiling Jack Gallagher? 
Maurice Strong is not uh, to be the manager of, uh, oh. of the act. I thought he was that? being groomed by Austin and CDC and this new Crown Corporation to take over Dome. No, we will name directors to Dome. And Dome will, this, the directors of Dome, the banks will name directors, will name directors, the shareholders will name directors, this board will name the management. And will you control it? Will we, the taxpayers, control? No, we're, we're having, in theory at this time, one third of the management. So, so we won't control directly. Yeah. We will be part of, the, of the, the board, and our view, of course, will be one third of the board. As in the Charter of Rights, Mr. Chrétien, when you were Justice Minister, you can always blind me with words. Let me put it in simple NDP-type terms. Go ahead. Is it not a fact, Mr. Minister, that your deal for Dome makes them the biggest corporate welfare bums in Canadian history? You know, I don't know what you call that, where this word is coming from, because uh, we're not, in fact... Uh, taking over or bailing, bailing them out only on a dome. What we do is the old system that has to be protected. And of course, you know, you can say that it is the biggest rescue there is, yes, but what we are, have done this time, rather than gave them a loan, we have decided to have shares. And I don't know what the NDP will complain about it because they always complain that the oil and gas is controlled by Americans. American. So now we are coming and they say something else, you know, but it's very difficult to, uh, to satisfy the NDP because, in principle, they are for motherhood. Yes or no? Are you and, proud of uh, this deal? I'm quite happy. I had for, for a situation where I had little choice, I think I made a pretty good deal. Jean Chrétien, Minister of Energy, after the break. Jean Chrétien, Energy Minister for the Federal Liberal Government in Ottawa. Simple question, Mr. Chrétien. The provincial government may or may not go into an election campaign soon, and you wouldn't touch that with a barge pole, but we are told that they have a firm 3.6 billion deal with Dome to establish an LNG plant at Prince Rupert. Is that now down the tube? No, I think that at this time, this uh, program is still going on. Uh, uh, the uh, dome has to go in front of the energy board and get the permission for export and uh, get the price right at the wellhead and the price right in the market and the security of the market and so on. This is a project that is a serious project, but uh, it's not completed as yet because, of course, as I said to you, there is the problem of the price and there's the problem of the security of the market. So nobody here can say Dome has a deal for $3.6 billion to build and export LNG from Prince Rupert. Nobody can say can, that. If they have a deal, you know, the problem, this deal has to be approved by the NEB. And well, I read that. It is in the process at this time, the way I understand. You have to understand, Jack, that I'm the minister since only a couple of weeks and uh, I didn't have uh, the time to, and I, no problem had been put to me in the last three weeks about the, well, uh, the LNG project. We'd, we'd love to see, I'm not trying to knock it, we'd love to see it go ahead, but I've me read too. the initial reports of the NEB and it would seem there are no firm contracts, no firm nothing. It's just pie in the sky. But will Dome, under your new directors, the bank nominees, the government nominees, and presumably a Dome nominees, Yes. will you be in any position to take on projects like 3.6 billion? for LNG when you've got all these, another point three, another billion to pay in interest next year, all the other problems with the Hudson Bay. Could you tell me that it's at all possible that you'll go into the LNG project at Rupert? You know, when the, uh, the organization of Dome and the finances of Dome will be organized properly because we have to reschedule all the debts of Dome so that uh, we will manage to get part of the, uh, part of the cash flow to go for uh, the payments of, of the interest and the rest to be invested into some projects. It's one of the projects that uh, the board will look into. And if it's a good economical project, as it sh shall be, they will be able to raise the money to develop it if they have, as you say, secure market. Yeah. And, it's a big uh, gift. You know, the problem is it's not for me to decide if uh, on the contract, the validity of the contract, it is for the NEB to look at these factors and rules, but the local government claims that, and, and the company claims that they have a secure market, then it's fine. If it's the case, 
that's a project that can be developed because we have surplus Are of gas. Are you the minister responsible too for the National Energy Board? Yes, but it's a board. They decide. I cannot give them uh, the answer before they decide. It's a very simple question. But if, you, if for instance, a, an export price made the contract, can you tell the National Energy Board, cut the export price from $5 American to $4 so we can sell? You have the authority to do that. It's not as simple as that. I think that at this time we do not plan to uh, sell our gas if we can lower than the, the price uh, we uh, get from the Americans, for example, for one reason. I think the price is not the biggest factor. The biggest factor in the market is the security of supply and the length of the contract. Uh, what the, peop the buyers want at this time is security of supply and they are willing to pay a premium to be sure that they have a contract that say lasts for six, seven, eight, ten years. Is the, I was talking to the government leader in the Yukon the other day and they're in a pretty worrying position. The mine's closing down. What about the Alaska Highway Gas Pipeline? Is it correct that there is no prospect of the Americans doing that now until 1989? I don't know about the date exactly when they will be ready to go. Of course, it's a problem. We have built our section and we were willing to move. You remember the Americans had told us some years ago, we need a decision this summer. We stayed in the house, we passed the bill, and the, it was when Carter was there, and the Americans have not come as yet to decide you know, their own section of it. All we right. have the pre-bill started a long time ago. In fact, we'll be finished the southern section of this pipeline uh, from some parts in Alberta to the market is already completed. We, the we, northern part, we have to wait for the Americans to make that decision. The facts of life are that we are still a tail of the American dog. We must wait for the lumber, we must wait for the gas. Yeah, but they, 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 no, no, this problem, the pipeline from uh, Alaska, is to take American gas to American market. Big, big. But it's not because with the pre bill we can use that pipeline to sell some of our gas now to the Americans. Yeah, but we're so stuck for jobs that we'd love the construction work in the and north. I, you know, that's what I'd like to do in my new job is to get projects underway. I think that we have to take the policy and make it work. And what I say to the industry, what is important at this time in the oil and gas industry, they need stability and they need quick decisions. And it's exactly what I want to give to them. I don't want to start from scratch once okay. more. I want to give them stability and quick decisions. Well, we know that Beaufort's in difficulties, and we know that the old sands, the tar sands, are off for the unlimited future, right? I don't know, because, you know, when you talk about the tar sands, there is the heavy oil, too, nearby. That's a different type of process where there is a lot of projects on the table at this time. But you have to recognize that this industry is moving very quickly in Nova Scotia, for example, there will be, uh, the industry will be spending $2 billion in the next two years in Nova Scotia alone. So that means that there is still a lot of activity. What for? For gas. There's, you know, off Sable Islands. Oh, yeah. You know, they are finding a lot of gas, and now they are virtually have enough to build a pipeline from Sable Island to the main line. And, then and that will be good because that might be available for an eastern seaboard market but in the United States. Doesn't it seem crazy that while the economy is going not very nicely, we are committed to all of your regular gasoline increases. What is it, 17 cents and then 31 cents? Can't you stop the price of gas going up? Because that's driving many a people around the bend. Yeah, but the price your of gasoline, policy. the price of oil at the well ahead at this time in Canada, it's much lower than uh, the price anywhere else. And I think that, you know, one of the problems that the industry always said that in order to get the cash flow they need to develop new projects, we have to let move up where we said that it was to be for the old oil, not more than 75% of international prices. For the new oil and the non-conventional oil, of course, we say we'll give uh, the international price. And, uh, you know, we took a long time to accept in Canada the international price and we'll never reach it with the policy that we're at. All I asked you about was domestic. Is there any hope of domestic gas prices at the pump coming down? No. 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 I'm, I'm frank with you. No, and uh, There will be an, uh, an increase, but we're reaching very quickly with the old oils, the threshold of 75. I guess it will be it next year. Yeah. So if the price of oil internationally goes down, 
We might later so on go down, but I don't expect that. Once to come. it gets to three dollars or three fifty a gallon, we've reached the top. No, no, no. It will never. It will not go there in the next uh, little while because we're coming close to the price fix. And I think that if there is no increase in the international prices next year, you know, next year we yeah. will be seeing some of the last increases for a while. You're still stuck with this Mexican deal, buying that heavy oil and bringing it into the fight. We are buying some uh, oil from abroad, and uh, you know we have firm contracts that Couldn't we have to respect. Without but we're negotiating down the imports of oil at this time because we have to take first the Canadian resources. Let's talk a little bit about general politics. Having oh, blinded that, me completely with yeah, your you're unhappy to talk techniques this morning. You want to be the no in politicians politics. can get away when you talk techniques. Yeah. Oh, know. but under rest, I love it even more than you. That's my life. I've been 16 years in that. Gosh. 19 years in Parliament. And you're only 32 now? I'm going 31. Jean Chrétien, after the break. So I'm on the phone. But are we here? I was, we're live again, Jean Chrétien. Um, why do you go about making speeches that we are a nation of bitches? Whining. Bitching. Whining. You know, I wouldn't use you these ones You were not there. there. You know, I made that speech. I explained to the people what it's all about. I said there is some problems. But when it's, the times are difficult, it's the time to pull it together. And right? I just complain. And it's what I said. I think there's a lot of things going on in Canada that are good. And when we're having some difficulties, it's the time to go together. And we have... The problem is we have the capacity of resolving problems in Canada. We've done it, uh, you know, for example, two years and a half ago, we were wondering if we were not to be a split nation. We had a referendum, we won it. After that, for f 55 years, we wanted to patriate the Constitution. No pro there was no way to solve it. We have resolved it. Now, now we're faced some extremely difficult economic problems, I admit that. But we can't face it and solve it. And I say, it's what I was explaining. And but the Canadian thinks what I was explaining is that we lack somewhat patriotism in Canada. Because, you know, you go in some other nations and when they play the national anthem, the people stand up and put their hands here and whatnot. And here we kind of been shabby about our nationhood. You yeah. know, we're a different nation. It's an Anglo-Saxon tradition, I must tell you, that you've got to get out of the place before they play God Save the King at Old Canada so you don't have to stand like an automaton. Is it just Anglo-Saxons who are like this? I don't know. I think that we, the, you know, you go to the we South. Are, the the, the tradition of the South are the different, you know, they are Anglo-Saxon, perhaps not British. But I, I explaining to the Canadians that, you know, of all the nations but in the yeah, world, God. do you think that you will have a better... You don't like to be a Canadian? You're not proud to be a Canadian? You know, we can say that. We go abroad. The people say, are you from Canada? Well, and when you say, I am from Canada, they are so happy to talk because for a lot of people, they think that it's the promised land. And I say that. Let's talk positive rather than talk negative, Webster. Now it's promised to the banks on the dome bailout, but that's beside the point. Let me put it this way, that we have a fair amount to bitch about at the moment. Here we are in the greatest country in the world, and we've had a liberal government for most of the last half century. Yeah. And it would seem that your government has failed us in leadership. No one except yourself says we have nothing to fear but fear itself. We have no positive leadership from the government in terms of attitude or atmosphere. Yeah, but I'm talking like you want me to talk. And what you report in a great speech, just that little line that I say, stop that negative attitude and be positive. Yeah, but don't you think it's time we had a real national change? Maybe a new party. Certainly a new prime minister. Isn't it time that we had some new blood? All we've got now, we're a nation of civil servants. Index pensions. More civil servants than people. Is that bitching? Somewhat. Because, you know, look at the positive side. You say that we cannot run this nation. I remember when I came to Vancouver the first time in my life in 67. And there was nothing here. The big building downtown Vancouver was the Vancouver Hotel. After 15 or 17 years of liberal administration. You can't find it. I know, there's only big buildings, you know, all over the place. All right, let me change the subject quickly. Yes, it's in, better to. In how bad a shape is Quebec financially? 
I very, read very bad, very bad. Is there going to be a, a new independence vote or will Levesque, uh, because of the need for federal money, now chicken out of it? You know, I think that we have resolved the problem for a long time in the referendum 1980. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Something positive That's you did. That's positive. You're improving. <laughs> Not for long. As soon as you go, I'll start <laughs> to... I don't like this word bitch that you use. How do you say it in French? Ow. Chialeux. Is that clean word? Chialeux. Oh, it's chialeux. It's uh, clean and joie together. All right. Quick, you're chialeux. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the phones. I wonder if you... Do you think we might find one liberal? I don't know. There's, there's a lot of closet liberals. <laughs> <laughs> but they've got nothing in the charter. There's one there, I suppose. They've got too, nothing, in the, now. <laughs> nothing in the charter of rights to protect the closet liberal. <laughs> go ahead to Jean Chrétien. Yes, good morning. Good morning. To uh, just make a comment, uh, rather than talk about the bailout of Dome Petroleum, of $1.3 billion on a national basis. Let's talk about the cost on an individual taxpayer basis and the cost of the, of the out of the pocket of the average taxpayer is approximately $20,000. What the Liberal government has actually done here is take $20,000 out of my pocket uh, because I do not you know, I don't know if you have a computer there, you know, to calculate that, but 25 million... It directly into the pocket. Yeah, but 25 million the, people, uh, you know, at $10, it's 250 dollars At $20, is uh, $500 million. When you talk about $25,000, I think that your mathematics is a bit wrong, but uh, just from 25 multiplied by $10 is 250 by 20 is $500 million. You talk about $25,000 per, per person. I think that you're off bit, uh, a bit in your calculation. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the, the, take the average taxpayer into one point but you know, okay, you, you divide it. Suppose there is more than 50% of the Canadian who pay taxes. So you divide it by two again, and it will be $40 but it's far away from $25,000. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, hello. This uh, question may seem ignorant, but um, it's something I've always wanted to ask someone such as Mr. Cushing in his position. Okay. Energy. Um, I'm wondering, with oil, coal, and all these other gas, everything that the whole world is looking for, why do we dig so deep for it when we have right in front of us two major ones, such as water for hydro and heat with our wood? Wood? I don't know what you're talking about, ma'am. I'm sorry. Well, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I have uh, a comment and one question. Uh, my comment is that uh, in view of the fact that uh, the government tax on a little bit for the purchase of Petrofina and uh, a little bit for the bail dome, uh, the dome bailout, uh, my suggestion is it's a solution to the economic ills of this country. Tack everything on to uh, the price of gas, uh, the deficit, and everything else, the uh, uh, unemployment insurance, and that will solve everything except that our gas will be 83 bucks a gallon. <laughs> and my question is, Cynical. in retrospect, Mr. Kretchen, do you not feel that the country would have been better served by you and your government and your leader if they'd have devoted the two years that it took to bring home this constitution to the economic situation of the in country. this country. Okay. But, you know, I think that when you, you know, a government uh, can do many things at the same time. We devoted a lot of times uh, on the economic problem of the nation in the last two years. I think that uh, you cannot say that uh, because we're having other problems, we should not solve some of the problems that existed for generations. You should say thank you for what we've done, and at the same time, we were working on the economic problems of the nation. We've put a program of, of wage restraint oh, that yeah. is working pretty well at this time. You know, the provinces said we don't come along, and now they are coming along one after the other. But, you know, you should say that a government can, should not be on, doing only one thing at a time. Webster is good on TV, and he has a great farm off of the island there. He can do two things at the same time. So 30 guys in the government can do two, solve two problems at the same time. I don't time. know why you threw me in, but let me ask. Oh, yeah, but, you know, because let me it makes, uh, let I me, want to add some right. life to this program. You want to try and hold me up to ridicule and contempt. <laughs> but let me ask you this question. 
with $1.3 million unemployed Canadians. Million dollar unemployed. One po Start again. <laughs> with, get that smile off your face. With 1.3 million unemployed. Yes. Why should any civil servant get even 6% when you've got 1.3 million unemployed who are down on you, I see? Why? We were the first to start this restraint program. You're telling us that six is too much. I would imagine. I'd like to discuss that with the union yes. of the uh, of the public service. Right now, I'm we, glad that you say that. So we, we will tell them that Webster in Vancouver gave me hell because we're giving them six percent. I'm telling you because I, I, I agree that a lot I'll, of people in the street below think the same thing than you. But when we introduced the program of six and five, there was a lot of. Uh, you know, I don't want to use some words that you use in the farm, but nonsense, you know, nonsense, nonsense, uh, horse manure <laughs> that were thrown at us for doing that, and now you're telling us that we're not tough enough. Well, I'll Thank tell you, you very much. I'll tell you something else. You can tell the labor leaders from me. If any, if this country gets in a more perilous position, you're going to have to go to massive deficit spending to create jobs. And you're going to have the same time as the Economic Council of Canada recommends, have a two billion tax break to give the country some life and some retail activity. I think that, in my judgment, the problem number one is for us to reduce inflation. Because there will be a coming back into the, in the, in Are the world. Are you sure you're right? There will be a coming back in the world market, and we have to make sure that we are competitive in order to get our uh, industry to get you know, the market they deserve. And that is our main problem. And I agree with you that the people who have security of job, you know, should cede some of their increase in order to make sure that uh, we will uh, get the markets one, we need. One. Because we are at the biggest traders in the world. But we have to be competitive to maintain our position. One final segment with Jean Chrétien after the break. Can this country afford, with your 20 billion minimum deficit this year, to continue two unemployment checks to one home, to continue family allowances to people who don't need it? Or should not all of these things be on a means test to prevent you from going belly up, Mr. Katia? I don't know if uh, to reduce it that way and to give it only on mean tests, if we will not fall into a hell of a problem of having a big, big bureaucracy to administer that. You know, you have to balance the two things. Uh, I guess that there is always some people who cheat, but generally speaking, the people who get it, 95% of the people who get these things is, are people who deserve it. As a matter of fact, to change hats again is another, without unemployment insurance and all these other payments, we'd be in real trouble. You know, people don't realize it, that the system we're having is putting back money into the Canadian economy. If uh, there was no, no such of these programs in place, you know, the retail business in any downtown of the land will be in even worse shape than they are now. So I think that it's difficult to always have a balance that will satisfy everybody. But on the whole, I guess that we have a rather well-balanced system in Canada. We don't let people starve in Canada. We think that we have overcome that period. We can share in Canada. It is what makes us such a good country. Except the costs are cheaper. You, you have more freedom to starve in the United States, and maybe their economy will come around quicker because of the motivation. I don't think that the, uh, our motivation is much lower than theirs. In some areas it is, but generally speaking, the Canadians want to put a good deal of work for their money. Go ahead from Kitimat. Yes, Mr. Kretchen. Yes. Um, I'd like to know when the shares that the government now owns in Dome Petroleum start paying back a dividend to the government, how is the government going to channel this dividend or profit back to the taxpayers, or is it? I don't know when the profits will come. We have for the first uh, 30 months, they will pay back uh, an interest in form of shares equivalent to uh, the prime rate for the first 30 months and that will increase our number of shares. And after that, uh, we will probably, I don't know when we will be converting into shares, 
when we'll be converting into shares, we'll receive the same dividends uh, than the shareholders. And uh, depending on the turnaround in the oil and gas industry, we will be in a position to receive some uh, income from this investment. Fair and enough. I, one little thing I wanted to ask you about on that. Did the banks, which obviously made these bad investments, and they were bad investments, bad loans, did they forgive any of the massive amounts of interest or are they getting their full pound of flesh? They will postpone the repayment of the capital, but they are expecting to get uh, back uh, their uh, full interest. F their full interest, but the security of some of the loan will drop from absolutely secure to less secure loan for, uh, for the part of it. Go ahead, please. Coupe ça va. Ça va bien. Uh, Johnny, uh, you said that you're out here in 1967, and it wasn't much in Vancouver, and uh, because of the Liberal government, uh, all these big buildings were built by them. Let me explain something to you, sir. No, no, I don't say that it was built by us. I never said that. I just said that for the people who claim that we have been so terrible as an administration for the last uh, 16 years, that I have seen a lot of growth, but it not growth created either by the federal government or by the provincial government. It is basically built by the people who live here, who had confidence in Vancouver and into the economy of the province and to the economy of the country. Well, because we have two pro pro prolific resources. One is forestry, the other one is fishing. That is uh, no. most in Canada. I, just I said get back to the point of dome. Uh, I don't know why we got involved in Dome. Uh, the fact is that I didn't give uh, the uh, mandate to the uh, government to uh, play in the stock market. Uh, number one, you said yesterday on radio that, uh, oh, you bought the uh, Dome shares for two fifty a share. It's a good buy because of the fact that uh, the shares are worth $3.25 yeah, or $0.30. Cents. The point I made earlier in the program, if you were listening, I said that we had little choice because of the magnitude of the problem not to intervene but rather just to give a loan guarantee we have decided at this time to not take only the risk and not take the, the profits if the industry turn around. So rather than investing and giving a loan guarantee like we've done in other instances, we decided to, rather than only risk to lose the, on the losing side, we decided to take advantage on the winning side, and it's why we have shares. The question I want to ask you on this line, would you vote for this man in the next election when he, if he was a liberal? Absolutely not. I like the guy personally, but I wouldn't vote for him for a liberal due to the fact that uh, our great Canadian Yeah, but if you Joe, like me Euro personally, leader, why you don't vote for me? Why don't you? He's a nice guy. Why wouldn't you vote for him? Well, because I don't believe the liberal principle. I, 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 I'm uh, totally opposed to the, uh, the Canadianization, which is a misuse of a word. That's nationalization of our, uh, of our, our, of our country. Lot I'm against the metric system. I'm against our bloody immigration policy that's made our social uh, uh, services here bankrupt. We're yep. bringing people here illiterate, uneducated, and, uh, we're, uh, the, and our can born Canadians are taking second place. You know, I'm enough. telling you that if the Canadian, the Canadian governments, especially the liberal parties over years, have not had liberal immigration, you won't have the Canada you're having today. Well, I think that Canada has been built by people who have come from abroad. For example, if we have the, some very strict immigration laws, Jacks won't be here. You would see the loss the loss of Canada. You are a classic political diverter, and I'll explain the facts of life. No, no, are you not you know, from your native Scotland to beautiful but British I Columbia? I didn't bring 55 other members of my family here. And I'll Why not? Under a reunification. You know, I think that we'll have better off to have a few more Websters around. <laughs> Next call. Go ahead, please. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty and forget all this complicated dome nonsense. What do you think of Chrétien and his, his party? I was going to say his boss. His party. Where are you? Hello. Is I, that me? I was talking to you just well, now. Well, thank you much. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Christian to British Columbia. I'm uh, surprised that they knew uh, or they still know we exist. I'm coming here regularly well, and uh, ask Jack. Uh, the last time I, I was here, I even played some, golf with him and I beat him spin-off from uh, your visits here. First off, uh, Mr. Christen, I understand that uh, we, the government, or you, the government, represent one-third of the board of Dome at this time. Is that right? Yes. Now, is it not reasonable it's not done to yet, assume but it will that be done. your representation on the board is one-third of the board? You will, in fact, be calling the majority of the punches. We will be in exactly the same position than the banks, who will have the other third. And I in see. exactly the so same you position than Dome. Sir, that it would be wise to bail the banks out of this situation, didn't you? 
you uh, again have seen fit for government to enter into the private sector and as the policy yeah, but we of were government asked appears to, let to them be finish total on. socialization, uh, you're getting on with it. Is that not true? You know, I'm telling you that we did not go after this deal. We were asked to come in by all the private sectors who were involved. By the banks who said, oh, for God's sake, save us, rescue us, help us. The oil and gas industry, I explained earlier to you that Dome is involved in every play. And if we don't keep that company alive, the oil and gas industry might have been standstill for years. Would it well, not have been better if you give them a sir, I put it to you that if government had have kept their long arm of their bureaucracy out of the private sector, the private sector would have bailed itself out in it would have been a battle of their uh, of the fittest for survival and it is my suggestion as long as government continue to feed as they do uh, into the private sector and into areas where they ought not be we're going to have a continual uh, bankrupt nation as your party have put us to this but, date but let me hold on call it up let me tell you this on this deal, we were not looking after that. We were asked to come in. And if the private sector wants to take back the position of the government today, let them come. No, you know, I said that on TV and on radio right at that time, that if somebody wants to take the position of the government in Dome, let's do it. Oh. But they don't. They ask us to be a partner there. I know, me, only sir, you could bail them out. Had the government not no, but he says certainly. that the private sector can solve his own problem. Yeah, you had four of the best, the, the biggest banks of Canada, but, and they asked for the government help. Well, what would have happened was that bail would have, uh, the Dome would have gone bankrupt. Yes, and you know what it would, have, the, and it would have happened? I explained to you that Dome is implicated in so many plays that everything would have been stopped for months. Okay. And if there is a sector of the Canadian economy that can turn around quick in the present context is the oil and gas industry. And it is part of what we're trying to do to give stability to the industry so that they can come back. After the break. No, no, I look grim. Anti-liberal. Go ahead to Jean Chrétien. Uh, Mr. Chrétien. Oui. Uh, welcome to the West. Uh, bienvenue dans West. This mm. is a uh, French-Canadian total Westerner talking to you. Good for you. Like and, my mom. And uh, there's two things, a few comments quickly. There's, I think, the two best things that happened lately to the West are uh, Jean Chrétien and Jack Austin. Uh, I think uh, that uh, my question is uh, on mining, basically, because I think that uh, we need to keep on uh, discovering wealth and resources and that the BC and Yukon particularly have uh, uh, a lot in store for this country. And I think that even if the metal prices are down, we should keep on exploring because also this will be a quick turnaround. And my question is, uh, will you commit yourself to listen to a uh, pool of uh, people involved in exploration in uh, uh, BC and the Yukon in the future? And uh, would you commit yourself in the air to have uh, uh, a great... Uh, take some time to listen to what they have to say and maybe uh, do something about it. You know, we have a Minister of State who look after the, um, the Division of Mines in my department, but, and you can talk to her, and she, Madame Erola had been all over Canada dealing with the industry, and she's a very competent minister, and I'm sure that you will, you know, she, I will support her in, in the, uh, the very good work that she's doing for the mining industry. But, you know, the main problem of the mining industry around the world at this time is the market. And we're exporting. That is an export business, basically. We do not consume the product of the mines in Canada. And when I talk about making Canadian competitive, is to make sure that when there is a recovery in the markets, that will be competitive because there is a very stiff competition even in the mines. But I agree with you that it's very important that we keep searching for new mines ac ac around Canada because we have virtually just scratched the surface of uh, most of Canada. Thank you. That was a motherhood question and a, and a motherhood, motherhood answer. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead to Jean Chrétien. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chrétien. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Webster. Good morning, sir. I have sir. two questions to ask for Mr. Chrétien. Morning. They're both relating to Petrocam purchases. First of all, how much did Petrocam pay for the independent and discount gas stations in the Vancouver area, please? I don't know. Uh, would you be kind enough to disclose that price to Mr. Webster if he would be interested? Who would be interested? 
like uh, you, Mr. Vester, would, uh, would uh, you I, give it to? I, I you know, we will provide the answer. I don't know uh, the price, but I will make sure that... You've got a Federal Information Bureau down here mm -hmm. which can hardly tell you the time of okay. day, far less details on anything else. And no, the I'll give it to you, is, Jack, if you think you're more efficient. Why doesn't Petrocan uh, gas stations offer the same discount as no, the uh, I've lost the old, side of this uh, question. independent stations did? I don't know. I didn't time. catch the question either. That's your fault. Really? You, you cut that fellow off just now. Mind you, you didn't lose a vote anyway because you haven't got any votes here. Ah, oh, come on. You will see. You got 12 We have more votes in Western Canada, twice as many as the Tories arriving in Quebec. Never forget that. Oh, I would say 10 times more, eh? Yeah, but you know. Last it's call a, from White... base to start. From White House. Last call. Hello, Jack. Yes. I'd just like to say that, number one, I wish that uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Christian were as uh, popular as you are from Winnipeg to the Yukon. Yeah, but I don't have any responsibilities. I'm just in showbiz. I know, but you'd make a hell of a politician because yeah, you've yeah. got a hell of you a want, lot more honesty. Which seat do you want to run, Jack? As a liberal? Yeah. My father would turn on his grave. So, so would I, but nevertheless, uh, my point is I'm in Whitehorse right now but I'm a resident of Faro, Yukon. Do you see me up there? Don't, what? Do you see me up in Faro? I sure I do. I have been there. You're very popular. Well, that's good enough, but you don't like uh, Jean Chrétien, I gather. I don't like the liberal politics whatsoever, but what I'd like to know is why, when they took over Dome Petroleum, that they didn't specify that Cypress Anvil Mine had to be opened by Dome Petroleum Toronto, Toronto, because this small they mine that employs them. approximately 600 yeah, people makes up for 40 percent of the Yukon Territory's asking. economy. Okay, I've got the question, my dear. going down the tube. Yeah, but what are you asking us? It's another government intervention in the private sector. Well, there is a mine. No, no, come on. You, you know, you cannot have it both ways. Over. This is That's a different caller. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Does Dome own Cypress Anvil? Yes. Well, this is lifeblood to Faro as Cypress Anvil. Of course, but the problem for Faro is the problem of any, many other mines. The price for lead and zinc in the market are low at this time. And what she's asking, she does not want the government to intervene in anything. Except in Faro. But, but in Faro. So everyone in the country is like that. Don't touch anything, but solve our problem. And they have a problem, I recognize. We were in, getting involved in Dome, now she wants that we use our involvement to maintain an operation okay. that might not be economically to operate. And you say that'll be decided by the new directors of the By the board of the, the board and the board will decide if Thank it you, is ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. to operate. Thank you, ma'am. Do you still have uh, secret aspirations to become one day the Prime Minister of Canada? The job is not open and on the other hand I have uh, I never told my professor that I will be Prime Minister. I'm not like Joe Clark. We did that. I have no commitment with destiny. I'm enjoying what I do, and uh, I don't, you know, worry too much about the future. My thanks to Jean Chrétien, Minister of Energy. Well, you'll be that for a few months anyway, until the next shuffle. Oh, and then until the next election, and after the next election. And after the next election. Oh, I like it. Uh -huh. Do you think you'll so win? Good, you know, I've, I've been in politics 19 years. And uh, next we're going to have some more happy, cheering, laughing news from Tech Cinemark, the BC Mining Association, and Charles Bourne, Chief Executive Officer of Plaza Development. But they have some reasonable news after the break. Yes, that was a uh, part of Hudson Bay. Funny, the last call we had to Jean Chrétien was from a woman in um, Whitehorse um, worried about the closure of Cypress Anvil up at Faro in the Yukon. And of course, that's also owned, it turns out, by Dome. With me now, however, and this might be some good news, is Tex Enemark, the president of the Mining Association of British Columbia, and forgive me for using your wrong first name, Alan Bourne, chairman, chief executive officer of one of our big, big international mining companies, Plaza Developments. I'll start with you, Tex. Any good news about the mining industry in BC? Coal is uh, holding up in terms of its employment and uh, coal prices, and that looks reasonably good. How about gold? Gold's not bad, but gold is a relatively small producer in the country. How many people are working in the mining industry at the moment? 
There are about 17,000 people directly employed in the BC mining industry, which is down about 3,500 from, uh, from a year ago. So 3,500 un unemployed? Yes. Now, the, the mines traditionally closed down for the winter? No. No. no they You're a year-round operation? Year-round operation. All right. What profits did the mining industry in BC make last year, net annually? In 1981, uh, about $98 million. And the year before that? About $418 million. So we're down from 418 million profit to 98. How many operations have gone belly up? Well, it's not a question of going belly up. About four uh, have closed down at this point. There's still uh, ore in the ground, and the day comes when it's uh, economic to uh, mine that ore. It will uh, be, uh, those mines will likely open again. Now, let me turn to Mr. Bourne of Plaza Development. Your big, what are your big operations around the world? You're in the Philippines, you're everywhere, aren't you? Yes, this is correct. Are you big in the United States? Uh, not that big. We do have uh, two operating properties in the U.S. now. Could you give me the broad picture of Placer in B.C.? Because every yes, time you yes. see a story, it seems to involve Placer one way or another. What's, right. Placer, what's Placer's story at the moment? Uh, Placer's story at the moment. In British Columbia, we do have three operating mines. Uh, one, when I say operating, in Daco is shut down. It's a molybdenum producer, but the supply-demand situation of molybdenum warrants us not to operate at this time. Gibraltar is a large copper producer, about 70 million pounds of copper per year. It's operating right now on low-grade stockpile ore we, with approximately half of the people. We have had to cut from 640 down to 320. The third operating mine is Equity Silver, where we're going full out and making money there. That's Equity British Silver. Columbia. That'll yes. be a small yeah. operation, will it's, it? It's a small tonnage operation. However, it's a large output of silver, approximately 8 million ounces per year of silver. Silver. Craigmont, was that one of yours? Craigmont was one of ours. Of course, the ore deposit has exhausted, and we're in the process of shutting it down. Yeah, and that lasted, what, 20 years? 20 years, yes. And that was a good operation? Very good it. operation, yes. Now, which are your principal unions in the mining? Uh, as far as uh, in uh, British Columbia, is uh, we have uh, operating engineers and we also have uh, who else is tunnel and rock workers us? and people yeah. like that. Kmaw. 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 Kmaw is in Indaco and Jib. All right, now equity silver is union free. Union free. That's, That's most right. unusual. Very unusual for British Columbia. And are you pleased with that? It's worked out very well for us. Do, are the guys on a profit sharing board system? No, they're not. Center production or anything no, like basically that? Basically, no. And you don't mind saying on the other that it's union free and you won't be afraid that came on the rest will dive on it tomorrow? They've tried. And uh, it, it's up to the individuals. It's not up to the management of the corporation. It's up to the individual workers whether or not they have a union. Right. Now, what about wage settlements in the mining industry this year? This year, uh, uh, when you look around the first half of the year, they still were in the range of 10%. Uh, this latter half, I would suggest that they, these kinds of increases will not come about. And will the unions, do you think, accept this? I think they will. Because of the demise of the mining industry as it is today, I think they will accept that there are no monies to be put into wages. Well, mind you, you've still got 17,000 people working throughout the That's province, correct. haven't you, Ted? Yes. Well, it's a lot better than nothing, but you say demise. Can you give me the broad world picture on, on the attractiveness of our ores to the world? Well, let's, let's just take a, a few examples right now. Uh, when you look at it realistically, copper is down in the Western world. Let's just refer to the Western world now. It's down to approximately 87% of its productive capacity. Lead, zinc are 85%. Molybdenum's down to 56% of its capacity because of a supply-demand situation. Let's take Molly first. Molybdenum uh, is in a situation now with a total capacity of 250 million pounds per year. That's a capacity figure. Consumption this year will be 150 million pounds. There's also 180 million pounds of excess inventory around the world. So they've got Therefore 330 we million pounds of processed molybdenum and no market for it. Basically 150 million pounds of, of market. That's all there is right now. So that's why Indaco is closed down as far as plaster development is concerned. I hate to ask this question. What could reopen Indaco? Don't just tell me demand for molybdenum. What is molybdenum used for? It's basically used in specialty steels. Uh, Especially steels are used in automotive. They're also used in drill stem, these kinds of things. When those things turn, molybdenum will turn. But first we have to use up that excess inventory. So therefore it's really a question of a high grade steel industrial production throughout the world creating the demand there was for molybdenum. Because at one time a molly mine was a, uh, an open check to the bank, That's wasn't right. it? That's uh, right. Indaco for Placer has been the cash cow for many, many years. It uh, attributed up to 60% of our profits in some years. 
So uh, you can see the problem when one of those cash cows is... Uh, and the same goes pasture. for copper, and the same goes for lead zinc. Copper, copper is a little bit different. Uh, the stocks of copper around the world are approximately in balance. Uh, the thing is with copper, it's used, uh, and it's a bellwether. When, uh, what I mean by that, uh, when copper turns, you'll find the economy turning, because copper is used in the house, it's used in automotive. So when housing starts start, copper should turn and follow. When automotive starts, as far as sales, copper will turn. So use and it as a bellwether and you can see the economy coming out when copper prices go up. What's the price of copper at the moment? Uh, right now, probably 62 cents this morning. And uh, the high, what would it be in the uh, good old days? In the good old days, it has gone up as high as a dollar a quarter. Now that's a pound U.S. per copper CU. And copper has never really been replaced despite all the plastic and petrochemical developments? It has been replaced, uh, let's say, somewhat, but uh, not that much as far as replacement right now. All right, now, um, shareholders can't be very happy in mining companies in British Columbia at the moment, nor can the mining association. Sure. Who would you like, what would you like to see <laughs> in the way of government intervention? <laughs> One expects this from everybody. What do you want in the way of a handout from the government to re-employ a 3,500 man? Oh, I don't think that there's anything the government can do in the sense of, uh, of um, positive action to uh, resuscitate the uh, molybdenum and uh, copper sectors of the mining industry in the province unless they decided to uh, electrify uh, all of the rail in western Canada or uh, uh, may do something artificial like that to increase the demand uh, for copper. Mm -hmm. um, what they could do, on the other hand, is uh, uh, restrain um, their demand for taxes uh, that are not based on profits. Give you, a, oh, would you are you taxed and only on profits? No, you pay no, royalties. Basically we pay some royalties and of course there are other things like uh, hydropower and things that are excessively taxed as far as we're concerned. Let's uh, go into some more detail with Alan Borden of Placer Developments and Tech Center Mark, the Mining Association of BC after the break. <laughs> One interesting factor that came out in an interview the other day with, with Calvert Knudsen of Mac and Blow was that he was complaining quite bitterly about 13 million in provincial taxis up at the, pu the pulp mill at Powell River, which effectively increased his cost of pulp by $20 a ton. Is this, ende is this endemic, if that's the right word, to BC industry, the cost of municipal taxation? Well, uh, municipal taxation in one year, as our annual report makes it clear, uh, from 1980 to 81, went up 35%. Um, the, uh, a whole bunch of other government taxes and government mandated costs also went up in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 to 50% in one year. And if you ask what government can do, it can be a little more sensitive to the tax demands it makes on industry when industry is losing money in massive amounts. Mr. Bourne, we're always seeing stories about hydro rates go up 18 percent, hydro 20 percent, hydro going up again next year. What does it mean in the operation of a mine? Does uh, it really kick you in the It does balance because sheet? Uh, basically hydro accounts for approximately 10 percent of the cost of running a mine. Most of our, our mines are large open pits which uh, take a lot of power to run the shovels. Uh, basically open pit equipment and of course the concentrator. So any increase there, yes, just uh, drops that right off the b our bottom line. Can you compare our hydro costs with any other hydro costs in this country or elsewhere? Uh, not in this country, I can't. Uh, I would suggest, however, uh, possibly in the United States we may, it all depends again in the, in the area you're operating. Uh, we're, we're experiencing lower hydro costs right now coming into a new property in Montana. The hydro costs there would be what approximately you, no. 7, maybe 8 percent of the total cost. You are, of course, a worldwide operation. I mentioned the Philippines, you mentioned Montana. Mexico? Mexico, yes, we have an operation in Mexico. Now, how much are you spending and why are you spending it in Montana? You're a Canadian company. This is correct. We're a Canadian company. 79 percent of our shares are held in Canada. Uh, when we explore, of course, we explore worldwide. When we look at countries and look at deposits, we found a deposit in Montana, which was, it's a gold deposit. It'll be a, a producer of about 75,000 ounces of gold per year. We found that it was the next one on our shelf to develop. It's better than what we had in Canada, let's say, or Western Canada to develop. So therefore, we made a decision last year to put it in production. Now, what about the costs in the, costs in the States that, compared to Canada? Uh, when you're looking at it realistically, we had budgeted 
to spend $100 million to bring this plant into production. This is 6,000 tons per day open pit gold mine. We are finding that that budget was a little high. These were based on our costs here, plus what we knew of operating in the United States. Uh, we have been able to come in now approximately complete at $77 million. That's 23% under. That's correct. Now, why is that? People want to work. Contractors want to contract. We've not had one lost day to any labor dispute. Plus the fact the equipment manufacturers at this point in time have equipment to sell and the prices are good. So we can package it and say those three factors make that mine much more. You budgeted for $100 million that's for correct. a 6,000 ton a day open mit that's, that's pit correct. gold mine operation. Yes, that's correct. And you're going to bring it in for $77 million. That's correct, yes. But you're unionized down there. What's the difference? Basically, they're unionized, but what I'm saying is people want to work. They're not, uh, they're not, let's say, striking for any little thing right now. Of course, you have to appreciate we're just in the, uh, in the construction phase now. You might run into the usual grief once you get possibly, into production. Possibly we could. You've had some tough strikes in BC over the past five yes, years. Yes, we you? have. Yes, we have. We've had a very long strike at Indaco and also a long strike at Gibraltar. Now, did you just solve that long one at Indaco by closing the mine? No. Actually, that was five years ago when oh. we had a long strike. We Gibraltar. Had, uh, Gibraltar was basically the same five years ago. Uh, no, we did not close mines because of strikes. And are you suggesting that Canadian workers and Canadian unions should adopt the same attitude as Americans do at the moment? Well, I think at the moment this would be a good idea because we're, we're all faced with the same situation. We're, we're basically losing money. Placer had its first loss in 49 years this year. We're losing $12 million as the, as the first half goes around. We can't see any Is that on your worldwide operations? That's correct, yes. We have some winners, some losers, of course, in that, but uh, the bottom line shows uh, we're in a loss position. $12 million. $12 million. For the first half? For six months. First time in how many years? 49. 49 years? That's correct. And you've made millions and millions over the years? That's correct, yes. Yeah, well, mining companies, you're, you're always prepared to sit out and keep your treasures on the ground anyway. We have to. We're cyclical and we have to watch the peaks and valleys. And this has been a, a, the longest and most disastrous valley we've had. But it, does it concern you greatly? It concerns us whenever we're losing money because we know we have to take uh, all kinds of precautions to conserve cash flow. In other words, uh, the precautions we take are shutting some mines down, cutting others, making them as efficient as you possibly can. Are you planning to make any more shutdowns? I hope not. The world, uh, basically, when it turns, mining will turn. When I say that, when the recession comes out, mining will come out. Not many good news, but we did open some new mines last year, didn't we? Was Port Equity Silver? Equity anyway? actually was open approximately two years ago. But there were some mines. Highmont there came were, on. Yeah, there were four new mines opened last yeah. year. Now, what about Southeast Coal? Political question. Can Southeast Coal survive profitably when it's competing? That's the Kaiser, ex Kaiser operation now in the unhappy brick. Can that compete successfully with Northeast Coal, which is getting $1.3 billion of public funds in for the facilities? Well, uh, I think that the uh, point to make with coal is that it's sold on the basis of long-term contract with escalator clauses and all of that sort of thing in it. And uh, the people at BC Coal and the other Southeast Coal producers uh, tell me that they'll be able to make money, and I just have to accept their words. But the fact is that the long-term contract with the Japanese, surely the quantities depend entirely on the state of the Japanese economy. You can't hold them rigidly to a maximum output, can you? No, but on the other hand, the uh, Japanese are sourcing their coal from far more sources than just northeast British Columbia. Uh, they buy from, uh, for heaven's sakes, uh, from we Poland and Australia and uh, any number of other places. That's the one thing you're not in, is the coal business. We're basically not in the coal business at the moment, no. Barrett's wants a marketing board now for coal. What do you think of that? Um, that's, uh, you know, that's an arguable concept. The uh, the um, president of BC, or the chairman of the board of uh, BC Coal at the Coal Conference in Toronto last week uh, talked about a uh, joint approach to uh, mm. uh, the marketing of BC Coal worldwide. So you're into Who knows? Time for a few calls to Mr. Born of Plaza and to Mr. Enemark. How's the old fella? He's just fine. Is he? He's behaving Spike. himself. Yes. He's been out gold Prince mining. George. This, yeah, been out gold mining this summer. He must be 70. Not quite. He's younger than you. He is not younger than me. Spike, whatever you are, my best regards. Calls to my mining experts after the break.
I need a refresher course from Tech Cinemark. Now, I remember last year, the provincial government slapped a fancy tax on water, using the hydro to collect money for their own failing revenues. What was that? Well, I jokingly refer to it as simply a tax on gravity. But what it is is a massive increase on uh, the use of water to produce hydroelectricity. And it, the tax has gone from, about, from netting the government $14 million in 1980 to $178 million this year, and it'll net the government $300 million in 1984. Our industry simply put uh, can't afford to pay those kinds of increases in just a very short period of time. How much did it put up your power rates from that time? Well, year over year, it'd be over $20 million. To the mining industry alone? Well, it'll be $50 million by 1984. Okay, from McLeese Lake, go ahead, please. Yes, I got uh, two points to wrong make speaker. here, and then I'll hang up. You're on the wrong speaker. Oh. That's it. Go on, speak up. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bourne said that the average increase uh, from wages in the mining industry for the first six months was uh, 10%. And I'd like to know if uh, he knows the amount of uh, increase we've been offered at Gibraltar Mines averages uh, 6.4 over three years. And if that is fair. And also I'd like to comment on uh, the long strike in 78 at Gibraltar was instigated by a lockout for the first half of it, the first four months, and then we went on strike after that. Okay, like two points. Uh, are you in negotiations at the moment with We're in Robert? negotiations at the moment, and basically I will not comment on what, uh, let's say, our people are, are uh, negotiating at Gibraltar. I can't speak on that. No, obviously you can't. And uh, when was the Gibraltar strike? Five years ago? Five years ago, yes. It would be the usual happy affair. I can't see my number. So there we are there. Go ahead, please, to Messrs. Borden and Enemark. Yeah, you, uh, you were telling us that you're opening mines in the U.S. Why not uh, put our money back into Canada? Well, basically, what I said there is this is one that has been on the shelf uh, as far as a potential investment for almost 20 years. Golden Sunlight Project was discovered 20 years ago by Mr. J.D. Simpson of our, of our company. Yes, I'm and not, uh, you're not also saying, saying that shovels uh, take a lot of hydro to run. This is uh, correct, They yes. ran on diesel fuel. No, shovels are all hydro. Okay, okay but carry on, just a minute, carry on. 20 years ago you found it. Why, uh, why are you now putting 77 million into it? Because Basically, the price of gold is, is to a point where we can get a reasonable return on our investment. And about now, that doesn't matter. We, we will do this any place in the world because we are a worldwide operation. Now, if we find a good deposit, Canada is not the only one rich in natural resources. There are many other countries, and we do explore these countries. In other words, if you found a good gold deposit in British Columbia right now with the price of gold, despite your loss, you'd go out and borrow money and that's, go for it. That's correct. If you get a good find. If I get a good find, and then it indicates a good return on my investment. What about correct. the bureaucracy in dealing with American governments as compared to Canadian? Is uh, it just about the same? It's approximately the same. I mean, you have to go through the same ramifications to bring a property into production. Anyway, thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you, sir. Mr. I got a question for Mr. Bourne. Right. This operation in Mexico, now that the Mexican bank has been nationalized, how will it affect your profits? Because I'm a shareholder of Flash. Basically, we don't feel it'll affect our profits at all. You have to appreciate that uh, one of our partners in this venture was the Mexican government in the beginning. Uh huh. And uh, basically, what has happened now with the banks, or with the uh, federal government nationalizing the banks, this makes our third partner, Frisco, also part of the government. Therefore, we have one-third interest, two-thirds Mexican government. Uh, at the present time, what we're doing is our receivables are in U.S. dollars. These receivables are, are converted to pesos at 70 to 1 to repay the debt. We repay the debt at 50 to 1, so we're gaining through their policy right now 30 percent. Excuse me. When we come to a profitable situation, in other words, after we pay off the bank, there are many things we can do to bring our money back home, either take in kind or I'm sure at that point in time the Mexican government will have released or relinquished, let's say, monies crossing the border. Tell me, is it a big operation you have in Mexico? That's again a silver mine. It's a little larger than equity silver. In fact, as far as a single mine will be the largest producer of silver in the world, about 8 million ounces per year. It will? Yes, as a single mine. What would that imply? A couple of hundred people? No, down there it employs approximately 600. And up here, the equity Up would... here, equity is about 240. 200 so you can 40. see the difference. 3 to 1. Yep, 3 to 1. Go ahead, please. Sure. That's you. Yes, Mr. Webster, I have a question for the gentleman. Could they please... Could they please advise uh, what the reaction of the mining industry would be in the province of B.C. in relation to what was Bill 31 brought in by NDP if the NDP were successful in the next election? 
Bill 31 was the famous MDP bill which gave her an option to take part ownership and tax you like mad. Super royalties? That was the super royalties. Well, any You're the next politician, you answer that. <laughs> Would you welcome an NDP type bill uh, if they win the next election? Well, remember that there is a general trend in all governments to tax on some other basis than profits. And uh, so without being either critical of the NDP or the federal liberals or, or anybody, or the federal uh, conservatives when they were in, in power, it's a general trend in government and we don't like it and it undermines the future of mining in the province if it continues. Fair enough. Won't put you too hard on it. Vernon, BC, go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack. I have a question for the gentleman there. Um, I've got a family of um, two and plus a wife, and I'm planning on moving up to Elford, BC, as I have a chance to get employed again. I've been unemployed for three months. Is it a safe place to move? Elkford? Right. Is that a coal town? Cool. Yes, it is. Is that southeast coal? Right. Are you a union member? No, I'm not, but I have a chance to get into a restaurant business up in Elkford. Well, no, we're not about to give you the predictions for hot dogs and hamburgers in Elkford, but by and large, the coal, Southeast coal is going to be there. It'll have its ups and downs. It'll be there for a long while. I think we could move second and carry yes, that one. Yes, yes, no we? problem with that. Okay, okay. So uh, here you are now, Chief Executive Officer, having your first loss in 49 years. Tell me something of, uh, that gives you confidence. Well, basically, what gives you confidence? I guess if you're going to be in the mining business, you've got to be kind of a gambler. And I think a song last year kind of puts what uh, mining people are all about. You've got to know when to hold them, you've got to know when to fold them, and you've got to know when to run. So it's a buy-sell situation or hold. You and got it. basically, we are uh, uh, <laughs> very optimistic people, and we have to be. It'll come back. It'll My come thanks back. Uh, to Charles. To Alan Bourne, Thank you. CEO of Placer Developments Ltd, Tech Center Mark of the Mining Association. You got no one to hold them, you got no one to fold them, you got no when to run. After the break. I don't know the tune that I'd sing it. You got no one to hold them, no one to fold them, no one to run couple from my mining friend Alan Bourne. Tomorrow one item is Bobby Singer, a gambler who's banned, a card player who's banned at Vegas. And tomorrow he's going to show us the secret of how not to lose at Blackjack at 9 a.m. precisely. Black jacket at the bar. How does that look? That's good. Try that one more time.